George Gale is the Executive Director, Director of National People's Action, a network of metropolitan and statewide membership organizations dedicated to advancing economic and racial justice. George has been an organizer and strategist for 17 years, crafting city, state, and federal campaigns on issues ranging from preventing foreclosures, outlawing predatory lending, and advancing immigration reform. Under George's leadership, National People's Action has helped lead the fight to hold bank big banks accountable, advance financial reform, and prevent foreclosures. He is also co-founder of the New Bottom Line, a national alignment designed to restructure our relationship with Wall Street and the financial sector and advance a vision of more equitable and sustainable economy. Please join me in welcoming our keynote speaker, Mr. George Gale. I think you guys got a PowerPoint, right? Good deal. Um, thanks. That was that was great, and it was a great 72 hours ago when we went we went in there. I, I, I just to follow up on the story. Every time a, a a family got up and said, "Well, my loan is in foreclosure, or it's you know I'm underwater, and I keep calling your office, and you guys seem to lose the papers, or give me the runaround," the CEO's response was, "Well, on your way out." Go stop and fill out a little form on your way out, and, and we'll look into it. And then he said that like three or four times, and finally a young organizer from Buffalo got in line and stood up, and she said, so I think I understand. If you're getting the runaround from Bank of America, the way to get things solved, buy a share in Bank of America, get a plane ticket to Charlotte, get into the meeting, get in line in a microphone, and then maybe somebody will pay attention to me. And that put Brian Moynihan on his heels, and that was really the tone of the meeting. So, but before I get into to, to what I'd like to talk about today, I really do want to introduce you to members of, of National People's Action, because um, really the work we do is transformative, not because we have a national staff, not because we engage in policy work, because everyday people put their bodies uh, and spirits on the line in the name of this fight. So this first picture here is a woman named Marilyn Evans fighting to save her home. This is right after the financial crisis hit, and uh, the Federal Reserve helped uh, move a fire sale of Bear Stearns to J.P. Morgan Chase, and nobody had held them accountable, and that's at uh, Ben Bernanke's house. And she led 700 people to Ben Bernanke's house. And I'll be honest, we weren't 100% sure we had the right address for Ben Bernanke's house. <laughs> but when we got out of the bus and started charging toward the house, and security guards jumped out of the bushes, we said, somebody bad lives here. We don't <laughs> We don't know if it's Bernanke, but somebody bad lives here. So maybe the next slide real quick here. And this is the showdown in Chicago. We found out the American Bankers Association, right after the financial crisis, were having their convention in Chicago. We felt a moral obligation to show up because all the big bankers were there. And after the financial crisis, I think we were all surprised. Like, where's all the action? Where's the anger? Why aren't people in the streets? And we felt an obligation. We had two days. We had 1,000 people there. And at this point, we actually got into the American Bankers Association conference. And we did this, we went down to Michigan Avenue and where you could get some fancy shopping bags. We said, we can't buy anything, but can we get some Nordstrom bags, some Banana Republic bags and stuff? And so we put on our best clothes, which in many cases aren't that, you know, it was like, you know, Salvation Army meets Sunday kind of clothes. And But we, we got in, we acted like we were bankers, we got into their convention and we shut their convention down. Well, fast. Yeah. We can go to the next. Next slide, please. This is, this is outside Wells Fargo in Chicago. Uh, Roger Davis from Cincinnati, Ohio, retired police officer who was also with us yesterday at Bank of America. He was quoted in the New York Times. Maybe the next slide here. And this is Barb Kalba, a family farmer who's had her community in Iowa overrun with payday lenders. And the payday lenders are actually financed by the big banks. They get their money, particularly Bank of America and Wells Fargo are two of the biggest in financing the big banks. And in fact, Wells Fargo has started a product to finance, to do payday lending out of their own shop. And this is, this is an action there. We'll go to the next slide. And this is more action in rural America. That's a woman named Rosie Partridge, another family farmer. Next slide. This is Mitzi River Singleton from Wichita, Kansas. And I mean, look at the power that she's feeling right there. And that was again at another American Bankers Association convention. Let's do a couple more slides here. And these are two folks with HIV AIDS from Queens in New York taking over the lobby of J.P. Morgan Chase. I think we'll be seeing lots of people take over more J.P. Morgan Chase lobbies considering the news of the last couple of days. 
they made a $2 billion losing bet with a lot of people's money. I'll, and I'll stop at this one. This is when uh, the, the financial reform bill was being debated in Congress, and it was clear the banks were spending $1.4 million a day lobbying against financial reform. $1.4 million a day. We spent $1.4 million total over a year to win this fight. They spent $1.4 million a day. So we actually decided to shut down K Street, where all the lobbyists are. And believe it or not, that is a 30-foot high puppet of somebody that kind of looks like the head of Goldman Sachs, coincidentally, <laughs> puppeting a congressperson. Because we felt at that time it was clear that we weren't in charge, the banks were in charge, or Congress wasn't in charge, the banks were in charge. So I just wanted to bring MPA's members and our action into the room. Um, I'd like to make the case right now that we are in an incredible moment, in a moment where we could, if we're able to think big enough and be bold enough, advance a transformative vision of how our economy works. That right now is the exact right time to think big, to be bold, and be unforgiving. And then secondly, I want to talk about how we would have to act differently as progressives and as activists, differently than we have now. Um, I think in many ways we've underestimated the power of the moment that we're operating in. I mean, in four years we've seen the banks bring the economy to the brink of collapse, the election of the first African American president in history, the arrival of the Tea Party, and the emergence of the Occupy movement. All in four years. It's like the pendulum is swinging back and forth furiously. And I think what we're finding is the, both the banks crashing the economy and then the long, steady attack on working families, communities of color, on immigrants, on unions, on community organizers, and the role of government has created a moment where more people than ever are asking hard questions about how our economy operates and who it serves. And if we don't rush in with a bold vision to take advantage of that moment, it's shame on us. And I think we've got a big decision in front of us. There are three clear roads we can take when it comes to the economy. One, we could just bear down and fight to save what we've got. Fight to save our homes, save our pensions, save our jobs, save progressive policy we passed over the years. But we know that's not good enough. That's defensive from the start. And if we're playing defense from the start, we've already lost. Secondly, we could try to get back to the economy we used to have, the economy before the crash, maybe the Bill Clinton economy. And while that was way more hopeful than what we have today, we know that economy was unjust in terms of race, in terms of gender. It was not good for our environment, and we were seeing a steady attack on workers at that time. So we can do better than that. And then the third road we could take is actually allow ourselves to completely rethink what's possible to completely reimagine how our economy might work and who it serves. But that's tricky stuff. I mean, the economy. I mean, I know our staff's like, okay, we're going to rethink the economy. I need to read 20 books on the economy. And I think our big problem is we think we don't know enough about the economy to rethink it. And I actually think our problem is we know too much. Our expectations have been so lowered by the current reality, that we have a hard time thinking big. It's like, how are we going to think big when we're getting our butts kicked? It's hard to do. There's a concept, a, a Zen Buddhist concept called beginner's mind. Anybody familiar with beginner's mind? And the idea of beginner's mind is that in, in, in the beginner's mind, there are few preconceptions, pre few preconceived ideas of what could be. And therefore, the possibilities are much more. And Suzuki wrote in Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind, in the expert's mind, the possibilities are few, but in the beginner's mind, the possibilities are many. So I think we've got to challenge ourselves to reach a state of beginner's mind and not say, how do we make the healthcare system a little less hateful? How do we make Bank of America a little less evil? But actually say, hey, what if we were starting from scratch and creating our own economy that was embedded in the values that are so dear to us? What would it look like? And I, I, we don't have the answers, and I'm not here to bring you the answers, but I will say at National People's Action, we've been in, in rooms this size having that conversation, breaking up in small groups, starting to re-envision the economy as we create it. And I will tell you, people will be way more inspired and way more down for that fight than the defensive fight or the fight to make things 5% less evil. So I think that is something we've got to do. But to do that, I think we've really got to change how we organize. 
and how we do activism. And I want to talk about four key things where I think we really could shore up our game. And the first is engaging in the battle of big ideas. We often approach our work as if we're in a battle on the issues, but we're actually on a battle about the issues that are going to be at the center of American life. And we're right now at the end of a 40-year campaign, corporate conservative campaign, to basically advance a few ideas that really shape the landscape that all our issue fights happen in. And the first is the role of government, a 40-year campaign to basically undermine the role of government and to give government a bad brand. And as long as that's the case, it's going to make winning on health care or financial reform or any re regulatory reform almost impossible in a big way. Also, another big idea that they've pushed is a myth that we live in a racially just society. We have already achieved racial justice. What are you talking about? Why do we need this? Why do we need this? Exactly. And in that context, we will lose. And to be honest, the other side is way more comfortable talking about race than we are. And until we address that in advance, our ideas about racial justice, we will not win on racial justice. And we, there is no way to call a new economy a transformative economy if it does not address racial injustice. And then third, I think that, that corporate conservatives have really undermined the role of regulation and reigning in the corporate sector and have basically pushed a myth that there is no way to have growth, there is no way to have job creation, there is no way to lift people up unless we let corporations do whatever they want. And that has been one of the big ideas of the last 40 years and I don't think we need any more evidence than what we've seen over the last few years to know that doesn't work. So as we run our campaigns on health care, on immigrant rights, on incarceration, on banks and foreclosures, we've got to figure out how are we advancing our ideas around race, around the role of government as an equalizer in our lives, and the fact that we, have a lot, we can expect a lot from corporations. I think one of our big challenges is we feel like we can expect a lot from government. But we sometimes question, do we really have the right to expect a lot from corporations? And we forget that corporations are a creation of the laws of our government, which it's our government. And so we need to learn to have a shift there to expect more of them. So I think we have to engage in the, if we don't win the battle of big ideas, we will lose on the issues. Secondly, we've got to work together better. I mean, I think that, here's a value at National People's Action, it's called generous and strategic collaboration. And I think one of the things that we're seeing is like, you take the banks. What were 37 banks in 1990 have merged into four banks by 2009. There is no way National People's Action is going to beat the banks by ourselves. But the biggest thing that stands in our way of true collaboration as a movement, three things I see over and over. Credit. Everybody wants the credit. Control. Everybody wants to run the coalition. And then money. We all got to get money to run our organizations. And while all those things are important in some ways, I doubt anybody in here works for an organization whose mission statement says, let's go get credit, control, and money. Right? <laughs> But that's where we get hung up. And so I think we've got to more deeply ground ourselves in what is the mission that we're here for and less in the organization that we're here for. I feel like I, I, you know, my paycheck comes from National People's Action, but I work for the movement. And I've got to ask questions every day about am I prioritizing the right things. And if you're waking up as an activist or an organizer or an executive director and you're thinking your competition is a peer organization, we are in deep trouble. You should be waking up your competition is, you know, uh, maybe a different political party or maybe it's Brian Moynihan of Bank of America or somebody else. So I think we have to change and get serious about working together. At MPA, we created a thing called the New Bottom Line, which is a national alignment of organizations all across the country. It's an unprecedented alignment of groups, very focused on the banks because we said there is no way, even if MPA was three, four, or five times bigger, that is not a game changer. The only way we are going to shift the politics of this country if we say goodbye to credit control and money and get serious about winning. Third, we've got to more directly challenge the corporate sector in this country. And that applause line may even be too weak for what we need to do. And I, and I say that because I think over the last 40 years, we've moved most of our capacity into challenging government to be better. And I think we've not been as hard hitting and fearless in naming who's the really villain in this story. I mean, if you look at when Wall Street crashed the economy, the Tea Party said, we found the villain and it's Obama, right? 
right? I mean, that's what happened. I mean, basically, they said people of color, immigrants, unions, government, but ultimately Obama. I think we were much mushier in naming who was the villain in this story. Wall Street crashed the economy. Wall Street lobbied to get all those regulations pushed away, but we didn't clearly, crisply name Wall Street and name corporations, and we do not have a corporate accountability movement in this country. We really don't. But let's be clear, Wall Street and big corporations are running the country. That's why we had the puppet with the guy that looked like he was at Goldman Sachs and the members of Congress. And I think many times that a lot of elected officials would love to watch us just, or I shouldn't say uh, elected officials, many corporate CEOs would love to watch us just battle government. And they're off on the side drinking martinis and saying, hey, we're going to get away with it again. So I think we have to shift more of our capacity into directly challenging corporations. And that's why we created something that I know... I know folks in this room have been involved in, but a thing called 99% power, which we said, whether you work on health care, you work on private prisons, you work on banks, you work on the environment, you work on money and politics, the real thing standing in your way is corporate power and corporate control of our democracy. And we've got to address that. So we said we've got to take a bunch of emerging corporate campaigns on those issues and align them. So last year, there were demonstrations at six shareholder meetings in the country, just six. And the spring is like the time of big share, it's shareholder season for the corporation. Six shareholder meetings, maybe 1,500 people in total went to those shareholder meetings in protest. This year, there have already been demonstrations at over 20. Over 15,000 people have been mobilized. Many of us, like, like Mr. Nugent and myself, have actually gotten into those meetings. And there's 20 more shareholder meetings left. And this is part of an effort of us pulling back the curtain, naming the villain in the story. And what we're trying to do is create a which side are you on moment for elected officials. We're in battle with the corporations that have hijacked their democracy and blocking reforms, and now we're going to challenge you as our elected officials to come in and step in on our behalf. And then we'll really find out who our friends are. And then uh, lastly, and I think these, these may be the biggest, is I think we've got to figure out how do we match up our action with our convictions. I think the people in this room and people with us all across the country have very powerful convictions but I'm not convinced that our actions are lining up with the power of those convictions. And in two ways. I think we need a movement of fearless truth tellers in this country. And, and right now the gap between what we believe and what we're willing to say I think is a little too wide. I think we actually believe things that are more hard hitting than what we're willing to say. And I think there are two reasons for that. And they're real reasons, but I think we've got to get past them. I mean, one is you could get really attacked by the right wing and marginalized. I know Glenn Beck ran a piece on me that was about, and I don't know how, I didn't think I said anything extreme, but he said, this guy may look clean cut, but Castro would look clean cut with a shave and a haircut. <laughs> and, but went after, and right at first you're like, oh, I don't really feel like getting attacked by Fox, and they were calling the office every day, and I was like, our funder's going to get nervous and all this stuff. And the good news is, like a week later, our staff's like, how come we haven't got attacked by Fox this week? What are we doing wrong? Which is more of the mindset that we should have. But I do think there is some fear about being a truth teller. And I don't think the other side is very fearful about being truth tellers. So I think, and I would actually give Occupy Wall Street credit. I know a lot of folks spend a lot of time in Washington, D.C., poll testing and massaging and working a narrative. And they're like, we can't figure out this economic narrative thing. It's like, yeah, because you've tested it and focus group to the debt that means nothing anymore. It has no edge anymore. And then Occupy Wall Street is like, yeah, these guys crashed the economy. They're the problem. Let's go get them. Everybody's like, yeah, that's it. And it was because it was honest and truthful. So a big lesson. I think we've got to like take the gloves off in terms of saying what we believe. Because as long, if the furthest, you know, I hate using left-right paradigms, but if the furthest left, anything anybody's willing to say is over here, we're going to just get sucked back to the middle and not be having a real conversation in this country. And related, I think the same thing happens in elections. We say, hey, we've got to make this stuff palatable for the middle. We've got to get the middle to come with us. And it's like that strategy has not worked. There may be occasions where we've got to do that, but if we're always coming up with a mushy message, we're not sincere, we're not honest, and we're not going to attract people. And then lastly, in terms of our action being as powerful as our convictions, we actually need way more people to engage in nonviolent direct action in this country. We, we are really coming out of a period where there was a dearth of nonviolent direct action. 
And why I think nonviolent direct action and civil disobedience are so important right now, because the political and economic inequality that we face will not be fixed in an election. I'm not saying it won't be fixed over a series of elections, but even the best case scenarios in our upcoming election will not result in transformative change. And also because the rules are stacked against us. Money in politics, Citizens United, the grip that big corporations have on our country and have on our democracy will not be shifted in one election. And if you go back to the civil rights movement and the movement to put it into segregation, you would not have ended segregation with a ballot initiative in Mississippi. It would not have worked. And the thing that is so powerful about nonviolent direct action is that simultaneously you actually expose a crisis that already exists. It already exists for the people engaging in the action, but you expose it for the rest of the world. And then you shine a light on those that are perpetuating, those that are benefiting from it and those that created it. So it's a special, special tactic that we need to engage in. And I'll just stop with this. Um, Nonviolent direct action not only transforms relations of power, but it also transforms the human spirit. And the way that the action we did at Bank of America transformed Mr. Nugent's spirit. It's a powerful way of transforming people. And it's helping people achieve what Lawrence Goodwin, who wrote The Populist Moment, a book everybody should be reading right now, um, he described direct action as a way that people found and discovered a real sense of individual political self-respect. And we will have no big movement in this country until we have enough people experiencing individual political self-respect. And direct action helps people achieve what Dr. King called a sense of somebodyness. And at a period of time, so many people have been pushed down and beat down. We've got to inject a sense of somebody in this and so many more people. And out of that, we might be able to build the collective self-confidence we need to change this country. We are in a moment that could allow for a historic transformation of our politics and our economy. The question before us is, can we think big enough? Can we move from being organizational operators to movement thinkers? Are we ready to challenge those that are ultimately in charge, the big corporations? Do we have the courage to be fearless truth tellers whose actions match the power of our convictions? The table's been set. The moment is here. The next move is ours. Thank you.